Well, what's what's what anniversary is coming up this June? Come on, what's coming up this June? Meteor shower. Oh, oh. Augusta. No, we've had, uh, what's it called? This is yeah. Rosie got it. They're what, the randalids. What did Rosie say? <laughs> the randalids? <laughs> no, it is the torrid. Is it? Come on, people! <laughs> June. Yes, what's what's June? The hundredth anniversary of what? Russia. Tunguska. Yes, the Siberian. And so we're going to be hearing a lot about that in the next month, I think. And well, we already passed the, the anniversary. Or they... No, June thirtieth. June 30th is the 100th anniversary. So the general philosophy of Tunguska out there is what? What do the unenlightened think it is? Oh, I mean, you know, there's pretty much of a consensus that it was something from space, that a, a bolide, meaning either a piece of a comet or an asteroid, one of the two. I mean, other theories have been proposed, but they just don't really hold up to scrutiny. You know, like a, like a black hole was one. An exploding spaceship was another one, um, but you know it has it fits the criteria of a low density carbonaceous chondritic asteroid or a piece of comet that you know penetrated the atmosphere, blew up at about five miles up, and scattered the lands the the, the countryside with um, with basically cosmic vapor that is now being found in the form of tiny microscopic spherules that is found primarily in the tree sap of the trees that survived the explosion. Mm. <clears throat> okay, Carolina bays. We've talked about that. What are the Carolina bays? Holes. Holes in South Holes. Holes. Oblong holes. Oblong holes. <laughs> Oblong holes. <laughs> and where are they found? Must be in the Carolinas. South Carolina. They're in the Carolinas and they're also up on the coast of Alaska. Very good, Jerry. Well, of course, we don't call them Carolina Bays up there. We call them Alaska Bays. All right, so here, here's, we'll take the overview of North America here, and then we'll zoom in on the southeast. And this area right here is known as the coastal plain, the southeastern coastal plain. The Carolina <coughs> Bays are found concentrated along this area, right pretty much from here to here, although a few of them are found up as far as... Um, New Jersey. I think the, the most northern one that's ever been located was in New Jersey. But the greatest concentration are right along in here, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and a few of them are found in Florida. On the other side of Florida or on the... On this, the right, this side the here. Side. Okay. Although interestingly, some, some strange looking shallow elliptical holes have been found down here, and I haven't uh, managed to put that into my program yet. That's where that postcard was I gave you. De really? The funny funny ass. Right where you're Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Where is that? Yeah. Oh. Okay, so this is the Southeast Coastal Plain. Who knows how many of them have so far been counted? 23. 23. Mm -hmm. Higher. 68. Higher. 14,000. Higher. 14,000? Seriously? Higher than 14,000. Wow. What? 500,000. 500,000 of them. Wow. Are you serious? I'm serious. I'm absolutely serious. 500,000 of them is the estimate. Well, at the end of June, mm -hmm. I'm going out to uh, Myrtle Beach to do a presentation out there to some group. And, um, I mean, that's right in the thick of, the thickest concentration of them is right there north and south of Myrtle Beach. North, south, and just west of Myrtle Beach. All right, so here's a interior. They're very swampy depressions. Um, one of the things that makes Carolina Bays unique, and this may be a very important clue, is that they have species of plants and animals that are found nowhere else. For example, Venus flytraps is probably the most famous of the unusual uh, forms of life that are found in Carolina Bays. Which perhaps suggests something very interesting because associated with the Tunguska explosion, there seems to be genetic mutations occurring. Are there mutations or totally new species well, from other places? Well, I have to, there's a lot of, see a lot of the research on Tunguska has, we've, has made, come available to us in the last five or ten years after the thawing of the Cold War, but I have not had a chance to really, and really a lot of it is being translated out of Russian as we speak. Mm. So there's going to, you know, a lot of new stuff, a lot of new information primarily from Russian research, and they are, 
Russian researchers have focused a lot on those on the mutations and stuff associated with the, um, you know, like maybe some like new plants and stuff. I, I I'm a little vague on that, and that's something I need to research. But um, it'd be some very valuable to look into further. So if you recall the story back in 1930. It was the Myrtle Beach Estates. So they were going to sell some timber, as it says, they were in Horry County, South Carolina. So they hired this aerial survey. Now back in 1930s, aerial surveys were a brand new thing. And uh, so they were going to photograph, as it says, some 500 square miles. When the photo runs had been flown and the prints developed, a Fairchild engineer in the company's New York office, Edwin H. Corlett, noted the presence of numerous mystifying elliptical features some small, some very large, all possessing such an amazing geometrical perfection that they seemed artificial, particularly some that seemed to be marching in rank across the wooded plain heading towards the ocean strand. So going back to 1933 when some of the first science started coming out after geologists, so they're discovered in 1930. Now, they had actually been discovered before that, but, but nobody knew that they had this geometrical perfection to them. Nobody knew that they had this, that this orientation until the aerial survey. Then when the aerial survey happened, uh, in uh, this Edwin Corlett, what he did was he contacted a couple of geologists. He knew, actually, F.A. Melton and William Shriver and said, come and look at this and see what you think of it. So they went and looked, and they agreed with Corlett that what it looked like was perhaps the result of something that came from above. For example, a meteor shower. So Melton and Shriver then went out over the next couple of seasons and studied these things in the field. In 1895, they were just, he described some, this guy L.C. Glenn described some peculiar elliptical depressions locally called bays. Yeah, in 1930, similar features near <coughs> Conway were photographed. Okay, so Melton and Shriver had this to say. A careful study of the photographs showed that the origin of these bays involved problems of extraordinary interest. <clears throat> this is the mosaic right here wow, cool. that, that Edwin H. Corlett saw when he assembled. See what this is, is you know, dozens of these aerial photographs. So he's taken and he's laid them all out you know, to cover this 500 square miles, and this is what he saw. And he said, what in the underwater? hell is this? What? Is this underwater or on land? This is on land. Oh. This is on land. And his, his reaction was, you know, what am I looking at here? What is this? You know, I mean, really, I mean, you look at them, don't they look like thumbprints? Yeah. They do, they look like thumbprints. Are all the bays elliptical pointing in the same direction? Well, what happens is, picture, they, look like they are, but they are. They in this, everywhere? actually what it is, they're all elliptical, however, as you travel from north to south, what you discover is that the eccentricity of the ellipse decreases, and the orientation along the long axis of the, the, the eccentricity of the ellipse, when you talk about eccentricity, you're talking about the amount of squashing, the amount of flattening, so the more flattening, the greater the eccentricity. An ellipse of zero eccentricity is what, Charles? A circle. A circle, yes. As you move from north, from <coughs> North Carolina through South Carolina and into Georgia, what happens is the eccentricity diminishes, so they become closer to a circle, and you'll see some pictures. I'm going to show you pictures and maps of the Georgia bays. And the axial orientation shifts, so it's more north to south almost as if something is spreading out. Now, we'll see, that's, that could be a very important clue. Mm. So anyways, Melton and Shriver then came and they, they got so fascinated with this that they <laughs> began to devote several years to trying to figure out what they were. And here is a map showing the bays. You can see most of them are fish water or not? No, a lot of them are, but many of them aren't. Okay. So this is what they, how they show up on a topographic map. 
So you see some of them some of them have lakes in them, others are completely filled with peat moss and so forth. Others are a combination of both. You see there's the original ellipse, oh, yeah. but then there's there, there's a, an elliptical lake in it. And that's the Cape Fear River flowing right there, if you're familiar with that geography out there. But if you look close, you'll see that there's lots of them clustered. Oval base, this is okay, South Carolina, as it says, note the parallelism of long axes of ellipse and prominent sand rims on the southern and eastern sides. And here, this, those, those alignments show how they, they're parallel and that the fact of having uh, prominent sand rims on the southern and eastern sides may be very significant. Now, based upon two things, the parallelism, the sand rims on the southeastern side, what do you think that might be suggestive of? What could yeah. that? Yeah, and what, why then, but why the parallelism? These are all coming from the same. They're all coming from the same direction, but in which direction would that be? From the southeast or from the northwest? Northwest. northwest. Yes, from the northwest. Because if it's if it's coming in, if it's coming in, yeah. So this is to the northwest. That's southeast. This this is north, right there. See north. Yeah. So the sand rims, the prominent sand rims, are all on the south and east side, as if they were pushed up, pushed out by something. Exactly. There you can see, what's interesting about this one is you'll notice that there's a bay right here which is being overlapped by this big one. And then we have a smaller bay up here, so it seems that in some cases a lot of the bays are overlapping. <laughs> but you can see there are, these are trees down here, those little speckled things, those are trees. And in the dry beds, do have people built towns or cities or houses? No, no, they're too, they're too mar. I mean, that first photograph that I showed you, they're real marshy and okay. swampy, right. quicksand. How, how deep are they? Well, it all depends. See, if you clean the the stuff that's out of them, <clears throat> the peat, moss, and all of that, they're maybe fifty to sixty feet deep, Ooh. maybe a hundred oh. feet deep maximum. So they're very shallow, but most of them are filled in with stuff. So you know, then if you fill them in with stuff, they're actually not that deep. I mean, some of the ones that I visited in Georgia, you could probably wade through them. But others have been filled in and they're farming. Okay. Now, is that different from the Okefenokee? <coughs> yeah, Okefenokee is in South Georgia. It's just a small place, it's not... Well, the Okefenokee, actually, it was proposed a number of decades ago that the Okefenokee may be the site of an ancient comet impact, believe it or not. And it's also been proposed for the Everglades. And interesting, if you look at Okefenokee, it's actually quite circular. Yeah, here's a, here's a Bladen County mode. So you can see there are certain areas where they're just densely concentrated. It's pretty. Here's a good example of where you can see superimposed we see one yeah. bay superimposed on another one. What would that imply, Jerry? Well, there was a, a period of time when they were coming in, they just didn't happen at one. Exactly. So, which which one was first here, Jerry? This big one or this one here? Well, the big, the big one. one, yeah, exactly. How many of them did you say there were? Well, the, so far the count is about a half a million. About a half a million of them. Okay, now this is this is important here. These are ghost bays, and what now here you you notice how they're this is why I call them ghost bays because they're fading out, and this is as you get in as you start moving up out of the coastal plain into the Piedmont. First, what happens is the really distinct bays turn into these ghost bays, and then they disappear. Now. It's important to understand that the majority of these bays, as we were seeing in the previous pictures, are along the coastal plain, and the coastal plain is composed primarily of soft, sandy sediments. And then as we start getting into the rockier, harder ground, the bays, they don't just stop, they fade out and disappear, as you see in this one. 
See, here's, here's a ghost bay right here. Here's a ghost bay up here. <clears throat> and there's probably a number of others in there that you can see, but they do, they essentially just fade out. Has anybody surveyed the ocean, uh, the sea line, to see if it continues in the ocean? Well, see, now that's a very good question, Elizabeth. And the problem with that is, is if these things were created during the Ice Age or the end of the Ice Age, they would have extended much further east out onto the coastal plain. Mm -hmm. But as the sea level rose because of the ice melting, this pounding surf of the rising sea level probably would have erased anything or filled them in or smoothed them out to where they'd be very difficult to see. However, and I don't have this in here yet, they have discovered that on the bottom of the North Sea, there are things that look similar to Carolina Bays, several thousand of them. Carolina Bays, are they meteorite scars? This was from the work of Melton and Shriver. What, referring to the sketch, one sees that the probable area of bombardment includes most of the southern Appalachians. <clears throat> Thus, the numerous meteorite discoveries in this region may be additional evidence of the reality of the shower, which the authors have assumed. Now, what they're referring to there is that there had been, in the 30s, there had been some recent work done, because first couple of decades of the 20th century, lots and lots of meteorite fragments were being found in the southern Appalachians. So, these guys are referring to that and saying, maybe these finds of all these meteorites in the southern Appalachians is related to the formation of the Carolina Bays. According to Melton and Shriver, bays were formed by the infall of meteorites of a probable cometary mass traveling in a general southeast direction and hitting the earth at a small angle to the horizontal. The theory has many good points and others that require modification. The main modification that was proposed between 1952 when William F. Prouty wrote this article in 1933 when Melton and Shriver wrote theirs was this. In 1933 American geologists knew almost nothing about the Tunguska event up in Siberia. By 1952 it was known that the Tunguska event was probably a meteor or a comet but the main thing that was understood in 1952 that was not understood in 1933 about Tunguska was that Tunguska did not strike the earth, it blew up in the atmosphere. Okay, so Prouty, after he studied the effects of Tunguska and realized that a low density object is going to blow up in the atmosphere, he went back then and began to take a relook at the Carolina Bays and he concluded that they were in fact not from direct impacts, because by 1952 the critics had come in and they said, well nobody's finding any meteors, nobody's finding any buried meteors. So how can you say it's meteors if there's no buried meteors? So Prouty then came along and said, well wait a second, now look what we've learned about Tunguska. We've learned that these things can come in and they can blow up in the atmosphere and not actually hit the ground, right? So maybe these are more akin to a multiple Tunguska strike. And that was then the uh, approach that he began to take. Prouty goes on to say that bays are geographically restricted to the coastal plain area between southern New Jersey and northwestern Florida, with most of the bays in the two Carolinas and northeastern Georgia. Bays have no relationship to geological formations, geological age, or topography. Some bays are on interstream flatlands, others on valley slopes or older stream terraces, and a few on the older portion of the present floodplain of streams. So what he's saying is that whatever they were, a lot of the, see what happened, this is along like with one of the, uh, this could be considered one of the great scientific controversies of the 20th century, particularly geological controversies, along with the Missoula Flood controversy, which essentially was finally settled in favor of the belief that the Missoula Flood was a catastrophic event. This <coughs> went back and forth between two camps that formed. One in the literature became known as the Celestials, and the other the Terrestrials. 
The Celestials were those who believed that the Carolina Bays were the result of a, you know, this great meteorite strike. The terrestrials said, no, 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 that's absurd. That's just like something out of a fantasy story. Let's look at more common everyday processes to try to explain it. <laughs> so in the uh, early 1950s, the dean of geomorphology at the time, one of the hot, most respected geomorphologists, Douglas Johnson, out of Columbia University, wrote his tome called The Origin of the Carolina Bays, and his intent with writing that was to settle a controversy once and for all and lay to rest this nonsense about meteorite strikes. So he wrote this big tome. I can have a copy of it if anybody's actually interested. It's a very interesting read, even though he goes to great lengths to try to torture this theory together to explain how these things could form by reliance only on ordinary processes. So the theory he came up with well, for short, it was called the complex theory. The full title of the theory was, and I want you to, after I say this, I want you to repeat it back to me quickly, the Artesian Solution Eolian Lacustrin Hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. Got it? I, I got that down. You got it there, Charles? The Artesian <laughs> Solution Eolian Lacustrin Hypothesis. <laughs> So basically what he did was he cobbled together every conceivable thing that he could come up with in order to try to explain the existence of the Carolina Bays. He said artesian because he assumed that up near the, the transition from the coastal plain to the Piedmont somewhere, there were our, these thousands of artesian springs welling up that hit a cap rock of limestone. So then they were diverted, and the, there is a limestone bedrock that tilts toward the ocean along the southeast. So what he did then, what Johnson did, was he said, here's the cap rock, here comes the artesian springs. They're, they hit the cap rock. You know what an artesian spring is, an artesian well. It's, it's water coming up under pressure from below. So the water comes up, hits this limestone cap rock, then follows the limestone down. That's the first part of the theory. Then solution is the second part, where this water coming down like this hits an, a fissure or an aperture or a crack in the limestone and then turns up and comes up to the surface dissolving the limestone. And essentially the way to picture that is like an upside down waterfall. So it's coming down, turns up, and it's flowing up like this and it eats the limestone away so it, as it just like a waterfall, as it's coming over a rock, it eats the rock back, right? Mm -hmm. Well, just turn that upside down. That's what he was describing. The third part of it was lacustrine, which was a lake. So the water comes up and forms this sinkhole lake. And then finally, aeolian means wind. So the wind came and blew across these lakes, and then the wind shaped them into these nice ellipses. So he wrote this book, in the, in the 1950s, and it was considered to be the authoritative work, and my gosh, anything that sounds like that complicated must be right. And so <laughs> what happened is Prouty was the leader of the Celestials. Johnson became the leader of the terrestrial camp. They duked it out for about 10 years, and then finally the two of them passed away. <laughs> At that point, the controversy just sort of went into hibernation, right? Nothing much happened with the Carolina Bays for, oh, until then in the 60s. Then what you had with, with the rise of the science of ecology, you had ecologists and biologists studying the bays as unique wetland features. But they were not, I mean, they were looking at the unique zoology and the unique biology and so forth they weren't really looking at the origin of the things, okay? Now, what happened in the 1960s was that it hadn't happened up to that point is that there were a number over about a, peer, over about a dozen of the Carolina Bays, there were transects made to try to determine what the bottom of the bays were. So what they did was they went through and they discovered that in each of the bays, they were typically 30 to 50 feet of peat. Then at the bottom of that peat, in this saturated peat moss, 
was this hard layer of stuff, almost like a hard baked clay they described it. They gave it its own name. They called it humate. Okay, so then they begin to do these transects using uh, ground penetrating radar and actually taking drill samples and so forth. And in all of the bays that they looked at, <clears throat> they discovered that the bottom of the bays were unbroken. Now, what, ha what that meant was that Douglas Johnson's theory of the upside-down waterfall <laughs> creating... See, what he, if you picture the long axis of the bay, that line going along the long axis, that would have marked this aperture that was carved by this upside-down waterfall. So when you then look down at the limestone layer underneath, there should have been a, 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 a fissure, a line there, a crack that coincided with the long axis of the bays. Well, there was nothing like that. So what happened then was Douglas Johnson's theory quietly got put on the shelf. Well, we won't say anything about that other... Well, the most authoritative writing on it, which was generally conceded to have disproven the, ter the celestial hypothesis, has suddenly disappeared. disappeared. So we're just going to not even say anything about that, and we'll just put it over here on the shelf and forget about it. And nobody's interested in what, how, you know, now what we're interested in is what kind of fish live in them, what kind of plants live in them. We're not really interested in how they got there. Now, the 1970s come along, and there's a geologist by the name of Raymond Koxorowski out in South Carolina. And he wrote a book called The Origin of the Carolina Bays. And having, after having read his book, I concluded that his motive was that he knew that Douglas Johnson's theory had become had been invalidated. So he knew that sooner or later somebody was going to come back and revive this ridiculous extraterrestrial hypothesis. So he came up with a theory that was as equally as cobbled together as mm -hmm. Douglas Johnson's. And that book came out in about 1976 to 1978, right in that time span. Well, with that book, that sort of like was now considered, well, here's the definitive, you know, maybe does it's not the definitive proof of how they got there, but at least it, it disproves the whole uh, extraterrestrial hypothesis, and we don't need to go back to that place. That was sort of the attitude. And if you look at most of the writing in the 70s and the 80s and even into the early 90s on the bays, most of them will make, well the theories of the Carolina Bays are, are numerous and there were numerous theories, probably 10 or 12 different theories. But what they'll say is they'll, you know, one guy, you know, one geologist theorized that it was uh, schools of fish swimming in a circle. I mean that was, that was one of them, okay, and that was probably one of them. And, and, and another one was that it was this big meteorite strike. <laughs> and so they would mention you know, the, the schools of fish swimming in a circle in the same breath as, as, this meteor, as the meteorite strike, almost to, you know, guilt by association so that, well, as ridiculous as, as fish, schools of fish swimming in an ellipse in a circle, so is this idea that it could have been formed by something from outer space for crying out loud. That was the prevailing attitude. These people went to college? Yeah, mm -hmm. presumably. And they were, they were, well, they went to college and they had, they were indoctrinated into the dogmas of uniformitarianism. Yes. That basically says you have to, if you're going to look at anything out there in the natural world and try to explain its origin, you can only do so by relying upon forces and things that we see operating in the present day. And we've never seen a Carolina Bay being formed in the present day. That's the problem. Koxorowski, what he did, he said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go and look and find present-day analogs, modern analogs, and he makes this bold statement in the introduction to his work, and then he cites three examples, right? The problem is, is that the three examples he cites are not modern-day analogs at all. Like, for example, he cites the Oriented Lakes of Alaska. But if you then go and you read the literature, and I'm going to show you some pictures of the Oriented Lakes, if you go and read the literature on the Oriented Lakes of Alaska, what they're saying is, Oh, these things were formed at least ten to 20,000 years ago during the Ice Age. But here's Koxorowski saying, well, we're going to go and look at modern analogs, and we can see that these lakes are forming. We don't need to talk about things from space. So there it remained, okay, and with a few exceptions, Bob Cobers out at the University of Georgia at Athens, 
uh, was one of the researchers who maintained the idea that these things were extraterrestrial uh, in origin.